As you can see, what I will report here is research from Lund, which has taken place during the last 21 years, and which is all based upon results upon rats, and in few cases, cells. So that's the basis, that's what we look to bring into your mind. Rather long ago, I said that this was the largest experiment ever in the world, a biological experiment, and uh, the fact is that today, almost two-thirds of the world's populations volunteer as guinea pigs in this, the world's largest biological experiment. Dramatic, and there is no controlled population anymore, because they are everywhere. And we should remember that we live in a very thin habitat. It's only 80 kilometers above us, where we are underneath the ionosphere, and the Earth radius is 4,600 kilometers. So it's a very, very thin habitat which we have to live in and to survive in. And only microwaves from the Big Bang, uh, five billion years, uh, until 1940, reached the Earth. The Earth is about 4.5 billion years old. And that's what has happened to us until very recently. Then came Sir Robert Watson Watt with his uh, radar, and was followed by the guy who had his candy bar in his pocket when it uh, melted, when he sat with the radar, Dr. Percy Spencer, who introduced the micro oven to us. And then came the mo mobile phones. You said Sweden was early. The original mobile phone you can see there, down to the left, that's from Ericsson 1956, but after that everything had turned into smaller and smaller and smaller devices. We have all these base stations and the important message on this slide is that microwaves today is 10 to the 11th, up to 10 to the 18th times more than it ever was before 1940. That's a silly little thing there, yeah. What effect can they have upon the living organism? Well, the living organism came on board on this earth. Um, uh, 50 billion years ago we had a big bang. 5 billion years ago the sun. 4.5 billion years ago the earth came around. And 3 billion years ago, a little bit longer than that, <clears throat> the earliest unicellular life came on earth. And then happened all this you can follow. And 2 million years ago Homo sapiens came around. So this is a very late event. And it's during that time that all this new has happened. We concentrated very early in Lund <coughs> upon the effects upon the blood-brain barrier. And why did a neurosurgeon, I should mention that, I, I have been a neurosurgeon since 1967, so <coughs> why did a neurosurgeon go into this very odd business? And uh, the thing was that we had read the papers by Shivers et al., the very fantastic group in London, Ontario, who were very early in this field, and they showed that the new MR machines opened up the blood-brain barrier of rats that were sneaked in during the nights in the patient's machine when the patients were not there. And I went there in order, hopefully, to be able to control chemotherapy against the gliomas, which was my major interest in my research since 1977. And my hope was to utilize these fields in a clever way in order to improve the, the finding of the gorilla cells, the migrating cells from the tumors, the glioblastomas, out in the brain. And my friend, Professor Persson in radiophysics, with whom I've worked all these years, he went there because he built the first MR machine himself in Sweden, and he was interested to see if this is really true, that it might be dangerous to people. Well, this is the glioblastoma multiforma, which I have been dealing with all my life almost and trying to cure, I haven't succeeded so far. Normal brain tumor, horrible tumor. It grows like an octopus in the brain. It sends its small uh, gorilla cell nests out into the brain. And whatever you do, even if you take away the whole hemisphere, but for the basal ganglia, there is always a continuing growth in the other half of the brain. So it's a horrible disease. My hope was then to reach these gorilla cells by help of these fields. It didn't work out that way, but I learned a lot about these fantastic fields, which really makes a difference to rats. And we learned during the first years, we repeated what they did in, in London, Ontario. Then we continued with the um, studies with immunostaining for albumin and also for fibrinogen. Uh, and we used the pulse modulate 9 or 15 megahertz microwaves. And since 1998, we have used the uh, GSM telephones, the genuine telephones, both for the 900 and 1800 exposure. So this was what we repeated from the experiments in London, Ontario. You can see this is a control, and here you can see how much leaked out of the vessel in the MR exposed animals. And here's another slide of the same situation, the vessel here and the surroundings. And that intrigued us quite a lot. Much of this, of course, depends upon what is the blood-brain barrier. There are such barriers between the brain and the blood, between the testis and the blood, between the follicle in the ovary and the blood, and the eye 
and the blood. So these organs so important to us uh, are shielded off by special, uh, special barriers. And the one in the brain and the eye is based upon the fact that it's not, this is the lumen of the capillary, the wall of the capillary, and there are very tight junctions in the, um, between the cells, so things have difficulty in just leaking out. And also there is a second layer, the basal membranes, and then you have all these end feet of the astrocytes, which form the second barrier in this field. I can't go into details, but as it meant so much in our research, the fact is that the blood-brain barrier is a very essential factor here. And do our rodent blood-brain barriers really it, it look like the human situation? The answer is very much so. And very recently, only months ago, there was a publication telling us that there are differences. There are differences between us. So here you can see the rodent BBB, and here you can see the human one. The human is very well covered by the astrocytic protrusions and their end feet, all the way as a thick, good layer. You can see close up here. When the rodent, they're more rosette-like. So the layer of the astrocytes covering the, uh, uh, the small capillaries is not as well covering as it is in the human side. This is new information, came only, as I said, half a year ago. So and I am happy to be the one who can to refer to it, because I think this is, of course, very important to know if there are differences, because what we say has to be interpreted as possibly detrimental or bad or good, whatever, to the human situation. We've used these TEM cells based upon research here in America, but built back home in Sweden, the TEM cells, transverse electromagnetic transmission cells, which we use all the time. Much debate has been around whether they are good enough and if they really are stable enough, because our rats are moving freely in these cages not too much freely because it's not a very large space, but good enough to turn around for the little rat. As you can see here, that's a rat of the normal size. He can move around in there while he's under exposure. And that is much debated by the, those who want to criticize this, that we can't know exactly how much reaches the brain, which is the organ of interest to us. But we measure how much goes in there when you have closed the cage with this little door. And um, this is... Uh, <clears throat> the way how we can calculate how much comes out. And of course, this is a Faraday type of, of a cell where the septum in the middle is the one half of it and the other part is this net which forms the cage. We made a huge amount of experiments for this before, before 1997. And this was published in 1997 in the Persona paper. And um, there's more than 1,600 rats in those days. And we exposed most animals for two hours, but a few of them for two minutes 15 minutes, one hour, and most again two hours, and a few even up to 16 hours. And then they were examined within 30 minutes in almost all the cases, but also in a few cases up to 16 hours after exposure. So this is what it looks like in a control animal, in a sham animal. She sat in this machine, one rat upstairs, one downstairs, and out comes such a control animal. There is always an inbuilt control where albumin here, stained by the rabbit anti rat albumin, uh, shows that in the hypothalamus you have an area where there is always an uptake, a normal taste where the brain tastes what is in the blood. So this is normal. It's true also in the human being. We have the same type of area in our brain where there is a free passage without doing harm to us. This is what it looks like when a rat has been there for two hours. So if you've been in this cage for two hours, been exposed, and this at very different levels, we learned that the rats that had the lowest energy levels, not one watt per kilo, not 100 milliwatts per kilo, not even 10 milliwatts per kilo, but one milliwatt per kilo, and even 0.1 milliwatt per kilo are those energies that open the blood-brain barrier most efficiently in our rats. The rats are always Fisher 344 strain. So here you can see in another rat there are these areas here more in the cortex, less in the basal ganglia. And here you have a close-up. You can see there is a vessel and the leakage has been some seven, eight uh, vessel diameters out in the surrounding brain. You can see the same thing down here. And um, this is what I already mentioned. There is a biological window where one thousandth and one tenth of a thousandth of the energy at the antenna, if you look, look upon that as being one watt, opens the blood barrier more efficiently than the energy at the antenna. This picture is a rather complicated one, but the only one I really have. It shows you this is one watt per kilo, 
really nothing happens. Six, in those old days, we had lots of, of um, levels of frequencies, so we had a continuous wave, there were 73 rats in this case. There were those uh, 8, 16, 50, 217 hertz, and then we combined all, all of them and all the pulsed ones. That came out with not very high significance for this one watt per kilo, but if you combine them all, especially continuous waves, you came up to good significances. If then we went down to 0.1, uh, watt per kilo, you get some of these significances in large numbers of rats, actually, 32, 12, 18, 91, 56, in total 209, and their controls. And then you go down to 10 milliwatts per kilo, basically, and there you can see still not all that much. You can see a lot at 50, not nothing at 217. But then you go down to one tenth of a milliwatt up to one milliwatt per kilo, and here everything is statistically significant. There are 12, 18, 6, 23, 52 animals under controls, and there was no continuous wave there. But this is what really made me very, very interested in this peculiar field, and that's why I continue to work in it as a parallel to my major studies on the brain tumors, malignant gliomas, which is really my major task of research. We looked into afterwards whether these controls, because there were not personal controls for all those rats that were examined during the first year, so we went back to our material in a, in a publication only a few years ago, where we uh, found out that it was the 0.2 to the 4 milliwatts per kilo that really had a highly significant opening of the bubble barrier, while those between 25 and 50 in this case, milliwatts per kilo, didn't come out significantly, um, though they were a somewhat less uh, amount of animals, as you can see. This is very much in correspondence with what the good old people here in America, Oscar and Hawkins, demonstrated in 1977 on the microwaves. Exactly the same thing, very, very low down, 0.4 milliwatts per kilo, that is corresponding to this value here. And they show that under that value, they have this uh, inverse uh, U-curve, which was often referred to by our old friend Rosady as well. We have made some calculations, where in the brain do you have those energy levels that in the rat, this is the human brain, in the rat are the most uh, efficient openers. You can see if you have one watt at the antenna, you have 0.1 here, 0.01 here, 0.001 here, 0.0001 here. So this is the level where the rat's blood brain barrier is most efficiently opened. And that is in the middle light of the brain. And then, of course, if you take a hands-free and took this uh, mobile phone away, you reduce the energy by 100 times, but still having it in your vicinity reaches at least the outer areas of your brain, if I may translate my rat's findings into the human situation. And that's how we started to say this, there is a passive mobile phone exposure. I gave a lecture to the, uh, United, no, to the um, European Union in year 2000. I brought this forward. It's fact is that it's 1.85 meters away from the antenna that you have the energy level, which is cor correspondent to the one that most efficiently opens the rat's brain, blood brain barrier. And also effects from base stations. It's 190 meters away that you have one, milli one milliwatt per kilo. It's a long distance, and that's the energy that we have found over and over again is the most effective one. And this is the French telecom, uh, no, the French um, uh, activist, I might say, who say we should really stay at the bioinitiative levels. Don't let us rush up as we do now during these very last years. What harm does then albumin do in the neuropil, out in among the neurons and nerve cells? This is a rather stuffy picture, but it shows research from Lund. It's not my own, it's my colleague in the Department of Neurology, Barbara Johansson, who made a very nice contribution in the late 1980s and early 90s about what happens when albumin comes into the uh, no uh, normal brain. You can do it by intracarotid infusion of hyperosmolar solutions into the circulation. There are special rat strains with stroke-prone hypertensive rats. You can have an acute hypertension by compressing the descending aorta in rats. These are, of course, major problems for rats to have these things happen to you. But what was shown over and over again by these people in Lund, in paper after paper, the album in the brain parenchyma, neuronal degeneration, the nerve cells degenerate in all these cases, and also in epileptic seizures, shown in rats, but also in human beings. And there were people who said albumin is the most likely, likely neurotoxin in serum. And the albumin in the brain uh, has been shown by Norwegian, Hassel, long ago now, 94, but he showed that 
if you injected the rat's own albumin into uh, his um, hemisphere, brain hemisphere, one of them, there was a starting up of a leakage of endogenous albumin from the rat's own, own, uh, uh, own um, blood system through the capillaries out into the brain and neuronal damage. Again, a larger trauma than I think that we give them by our mobiles. We went further. In 2003, we um, uh, published this paper in the um, Environmental Health Perspectives that damage to the brain uh, cells. Are there any such damage in our rats? It was a small material, you can see, only eight animals in each group. It was 2 milliwatts, 20 milliwatts, and 200 milliwatts in eight animals each. And then we have the sham uh, animals, which were as many. They were allowed to survive for 50 days after one two-hour exposure. They were anesthetized and sacrificed, and the perfusion fixation as always in all our animals from the beginning to the end. And then they were uh, examined by a neuropathologist. There was albumin leakage also after 50 days. We didn't comment too much upon it in our paper 2003 because we are still not quite sure about what sort of leakage that is. But we could see it and we could demonstrate it. We didn't comment too much in the paper. Well, the thing we commented upon was that there were dark neurons. That's an effect of damage to these neurons, uh, which could be seen 50 days after two hours uh, GSM exposure. And they were seen in the hippocampus. You can see them here as shrunk neurons, according to my neuropathologist, clearly sick neurons, 50 days out of exposure. We are very astonished ourself, ourselves upon this finding, peculiar. I don't even recall why we waited 50 days. It's a long time, sounds a little bit silly, but this came out, and it came out significantly so. It's, you know, here we can see the cortex as well, out in the superficial part of the brain, there are also these dark neurons, whatever they mean. So up to 2% of the neurons were damaged 50 days after two-hour exposure. And the significance came out at this level, 0.002, by the crustal volleys. So uh, this seemed to be a solid information. But many people asked, of course, can that be true? Why 50 days? So we said to ourselves, let us do it again. Continue with 7, 14, and 28 days and see what happens. So we have done all that work during the years that have followed. So we have studied both the neuronal uptake and the albumin leakage in 48 animals in each group. And um, we also, the old one was 32 animals. We added a few more, as you can see, 7, 14, and 28 days. And um, this was a well-controlled uh, study with as many ma male as females, and the numbers were equivalent in the place. But you may see we added in the later studies also the two milli uh, 0 0.2 milliwatts level. Two minutes, thanks. And here are the results. After seven days and 40 days, there is albumin foci. You can see them here, but you also can see them after 50 days, as I mentioned to you. We have the neuronal albumin, where neurons make an uptake of uh, albumin, straight into the neurons, the thinkers of our brain. Significantly so after seven days and 14 days, but not after 28 days and 50 days. The dark neurons were never seen after the seven days and the 14 days, but they were seen after the 28 days, and at cl clearly significant levels. So we added even uh, a later study, a longer follow-up study, on uh, 386 days where they were treated every day with a repeated two hours a week exposure. And there are information upon what happened to blubber and bearer. Not too much, because the controls were very much alike the exposed elements after they were about, they were 19 months old when they died, and they were about 67 years old if they were humans. So I won't go into that in detail, but I would say there are cognitive functions influenced upon in this study with the long timers. As you can see, there is the number of animals in each group. And this is what happened. The episodic memory test was clearly influenced 